Dear brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before I start talking about the Islamic human needs model, I would like just to uh, respond very quickly to the raised questions. Some of the questions were raised from some of the sisters and the brothers as well last time in our last session. One of them uh, was about the classification of human of human um, nature i mean um, there are a lot of books in different languages talking about the human nature from an islamic perspective you can refer to all of these kind of books but um, um, what we are talking about today we'll be talking about the classification of human needs, which is relevant to human nature. And I hope that we will shed some light um, on the issues you have raised today, inshallah. Uh, with regard to other sister, she was talking about the principle we input and how it is related to the um, social um, uh, activities. In fact, education is a social activity, as we know, student and teacher interaction, student to student interaction, and so on, even a student with the environment. So um, the principle I mentioned is relevant to the healthy interaction, social interaction between student and teachers. Brother Wasim, um, uh, he was talking about the um, uh, integration of knowledge in our uh, educational, Muslim educational system in the past. Yes, we have to say that uh, Muslim education has have gone through different phases uh, of integration. Uh, but as we all know, that revelation was at the core of any discipline. But nowadays, since the expansion of knowledge, what we are looking for is uh, maybe a different way of integration, might take different form, which is suitable to our time and context. So uh, as we go along, we will be able to uh, uh, discover uh, these kind of forms of integration. And finally, Brother Faisal, he was asking whether we can emphasize principle in um, economy and in sociology and other uh, discipline yes yes of course we can i mean there are a lot of books authored by muslim thinkers and scholars who emphasize a lot of principle from quran sunnah regarding the different discipline so it is our own uh, intention to encourage our brother and sister to read the quran sunnah with a view in mind that they have to implement such kind of um, things in, in their own daily life. Now, today, we will be talking about Islamic human needs model. In fact, I have to tell you that, uh, I mean, in our uh, universities and colleges, we've been studying psychology, and one of the main topics of psychology was uh, motivation and uh, needs and the relationship between motivation and needs. So uh, Abraham Maslow in 1943 uh, 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 proposed a hierarchy of needs. Um, uh, he was criticized by many people in many ways, and people offer different options. However, we might need to visit 
and revisit this uh, hierarchy and come up with our own hierarchy, not really a hierarchy, it's just areas of needs, broad areas of needs uh, from uh, Quran and Sunnah. And Alhamdulillah, our scholars have done a marvelous job in doing that. So we will be basing our own model on the work of the Muslim scholars who is driven from Quran and Sunnah. Okay, let me first talk about Maslow himself. What are the hierarchy of need of Maslow, Abraham Maslow, in 1943? So it's more than, what, uh, 70 years uh, now, uh, but still people are still adopting, particularly practitioners in management and uh, organization, they use this hierarchy to uh, um, support their decision re regarding the incentive and motivation of workers and so on. So he has five hierarchical of the hierarchy of needs. Number one is the physiological needs. And this will include food, water, breathing, homeostasis, and others. Also the second, um, what he labeled as security and safety needs. The security he meant by financial security, which we are going to say that it's very limiting, the financial security here, because he's focusing on the individual more on the society. We are talking about the needs not only of individual, but society, families, and so on, and humanity at large. Also health and wellness, safety against accident injury. And then he moved to the third one, the social needs, which include as love, acceptance, and belonging, which include friendship, romantic attachment, family, social groups, community groups, and even church and religious organization. Now, as we can see that he came up with this um, uh, classification of needs as a result of their own culture and the realization of human basic needs as well. Um, STEAM needs, that's, so he categorized them into two phases, the first three and the last two. The first three which focus on survival. Now he's talking about the STEAM needs, at the fourth level in Maslow hierarchy is the need for appreciation and respect from others. Then self-actualization needs, and that's to achieve one's potential as human beings. Now that these are the five needs or areas of needs. What about us? Um, how can we classify the needs on the basis of our Islamic paradigm. Well, first of all, we have to know that basic human needs are the essential requirements for the well-being and success of individuals, families, organizations, societies, and humanity at large in order to succeed in both this life and the life to come. That is the conceptualization of needs from an Islamic worldview. Now, who decides what are the basic human needs? Well, the worldview, the paradigm, the philosophy, the ideology, the religion, the culture will, of course, have a say over what is basic human needs. Now, in our deen and religion, we have first to go to the authentic knowledge. And the authentic knowledge, the Quran and the authentic Sunnah. So that we can get the guidelines and the main areas of needs. Because we believe that everybody should take it as taken for granted an assumption that the one who makes something, a machine, He's the only one he is entitled to write the instruction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our creator. He's the only one who knows about our needs because he's the creator. That's why he revealed 
the Quran and Sunnah, and He sent prophets and messengers in order to show us how we conduct our life according to His instruction. So if we have taken this assumption and accepted it, then there is no room to go anywhere else. We have to go first to the revealed knowledge that is the Quran and the authentic Sunnah to see whether we can understand from it, from the meaning of the verses or hadith, what are the basic needs. Alhamdulillah, that our scholars through the different uh, phases of history, they have rigorously reflected upon the Quran and the Sunnah. And they found out that all Quran and Sunnah is trying to achieve overall general goals. And what they call them maqasid. These five goals. So now we know what Maslow had said about hierarchy of needs. But as I said, Allah is the only one who knows what are the basic needs. So looking at Quran and Sunnah is the only way, the first step. Through logic and reasoning and doing research and experience, we might arrive at part of the truth, but not the whole truth. So we might arrive at some plausible logical needs through thinking, reasoning, and conducting research, objective research. Yet, because we are human beings, we have our own weaknesses, we have limited resources, limited knowledge, limited, limited tools, limited capabilities and abilities, then we might arrive at some of the truth. So we need the support of revelation, which come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the source of all knowledge. So yes, Maslow has done something, which might be some of it good, some of it bad, something acceptable, something unacceptable. In fact, as I said, scholars in the Western world have criticized Maslow theory. I mean, like now, he claimed it, uh, the, the all needs are hierarchical. So you cannot achieve self-esteem or self-actualization unless you fulfill the previous one, which is not true. It never happened in this life. You can sometime with little amount of financial support, you can achieve a lot in your life. So it's not hierarchical. Also, He's talking about something relevant to culture. So even the fulfillment of certain needs, like what he said, the sex and others, financial security and so on, sometimes the desire, whims, and wishes of people might fulfill such kind of things, uh, such kind of needs, but in a wrong way. That's why in our Islamic tradition, we have to achieve this aim in a lawful way and protect ourselves from the bad temptations of our desire and whims. Now, let us now, after this brief introduction, let us talk about the Islamic human needs model. As I said, our Muslim scholar, our Muslim scholars have developed very comprehensive theory of human purposes or maqasid. The purposes of maqasid reflect five basic needs. We can capitalize upon this maqasid to develop the model of human needs. And when I say human needs, it means for Muslim and non-Muslim, universal. As our scholars, when they reported and have concluded in this maqasid, they said this maqasid, it includes all human beings. The 
five basic human needs, which could be derived from maqasid, are religious needs, life needs, family needs, intellectual needs, and wealth needs. So we are trying to accommodate the needs in the light of maqasid theory. So our approach is more of a holistic, integrated approach, which integrates spiritual, social, physical, physiological, intellectual, psychological, emotional, and economic components of human personalities. Now let me just go through this classification of needs, and I find it difficult to say hierarchy of needs because they are interactive. First, let us talk about religious human needs, which is very basic. Very basic. Why it is basic? Because the, 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 the method which give us the meaning of life and the guidance to fulfill other needs is our Iman. Iman and the Ibadah is number one. So human being by nature, they want to worship superpower. And Alhamdulillah, that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has saved us from um, disobedience and going astray to follow his instruction in Quran and Sunnah. So religion plays a great role in our life and we cannot say that religion has nothing. Nowadays, researcher has started to attack secularism because they thought this is the only way to save humanity. But they found out we cannot do away with religion um, and its role in bringing happiness and peace into people's life. Belief system let people feel more relaxed and happy. But at the same time, in this respect, we have to provide humanity with the freedom of religion. No compulsion in religion. So, we have also to develop religious belief and practice in a very supportive environment for individual and society well-being. Muslim ultimate aim is to please Allah in what they believe, say, and behave according to Allah's commandment in this life and the life to come. So that's number one. So if we want happiness, if we want to establish good human well-being in this life and the life to come, we have to start to fulfill the needs of Iman. That is the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Success in this life is based on success of Allah's pleasure. Many special spiritual needs are fulfilled in the recognition of the meaning and purpose of life. Healing from all psychological wounds creating hope and optimism, establishing internal peace, enhancing self-esteem, relief from guilt, repenting to Allah and seeking forgiveness, fulfilling such needs, improve people's well-being. That's why we now, many people refer to Islamic clinical psychology in order to help themselves. So if we are looking for happiness and optimism and prosperity, we have to start with Iman. And that is the core of the matter and is different from any other classification of needs. Number two, life needs. And here, life needs, there are several physical and physiological needs such as breathing, food, water, health, shelter, psychological and social support. More life needs include sleep, sex, and also security from all harm. Because there are two dimensions for every area of needs in Islam. 
want to achieve the potential of this human being. Second is to protect them from harm in this area. So there is a positive side and negative side of needs. More life needs include, as they said, sleep, sex, and don't security from all harm, which might affect human life, like physical, societal, environmental harms and others. Life needs also need to improve human life and health so that people have a better and rewarding psychological, emotional, and physiological quality of life. So it's a more comprehensive and holistic concept of life. In order to fulfill it, you have to look at the physical, physiological, psychological, environmental, societal, and so on. Number three, the family needs. And the coming generation, because Islam is caring about the future of generation, not only the current family. And this category of need focused on forming a peaceful and harmonious family life with its implication on parenting, love, and the sense of belonging to the family and relative, which is the extended family. It also relates to the protection of the good life of the family, the availability of family services and support by all different agents in the society, and the main aim of this is to have quality family life. Now, number four, which is the mind, protecting the mind. Now we are talking about intellectual needs. In this category of needs, individual and society is in need of intellectual freedom, thinking and expression. The individual need to access learning easily and develop their potential through their life. People are in need to develop their thinking and knowledge. Opportunities are needed to help people to put their knowledge into benefits for the society and humanity. People's mind also need to be protected from any harm which may affect the beneficial utilization of intellectual abilities and powers and putting them for the service of society and humanity. Individual and society are in need to protect them in order to activate mind for the benefit of society and humanity will be. Some of the, of the intellectual harm are following personal and un-Islamic personal whims, desire, and forbidden drugs and alcohol. As I said, there are positive sides to create access for learning and support and also to protect from any undesired negative effect which might affect the utilization of intellectual powers. Finally, the area of needs is the property and wealth needs. First, Allah, from an Islamic perspective, own everything, including ourselves. The sense of lawful ownership is part of the human nature. Human beings are in need of employment and halal earning so that they can support themselves. The property of individual and society is in need of protection from corruption. That's the negative side of the needs cheating, stealing, or exploitation. All citizens are need to be self-sufficient and find that the society wealth is managed fairly according to Islamic economic principle. Each individual and society economic needs is to be fulfilled fairly. Now, even as you could see, Islam has given more emphasis on this aspect, but not for the individual alone but for society and humanity as well. So it has to be noted that in Islam, as a comprehensive religion, which regulates people's lives, the fulfillment of human needs is governed by Allah's commandments stated in the Quran and the Sunnah. And this is, in brief, um, the model I have designed to indicate the different types of the areas of needs started with the religious needs that the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the guidance then life needs then thy lineage of family needs then knowledge and intellectual needs 
and then wealth needs or economic needs. Now, there are five where the Muslim scholars have stated quite clearly that all Quran and Sunnah, that the Sharia is striving to achieve these goals and needs. So if you want to organize, sorry, to, to establish a good family, we have to fulfill these needs. In a society, the government should do that. In an organization, we have to strive to do that. So for individuals, for families, for organization, for societies, and for humanity, even international NGOs, international foundations, they have to agree because these are human and universal. It's not restricted to particular culture or particular group of people, but it is a global, universal, and human needs. Because Allah is the creator. He is the only one who knows. And the Quran Sunnah is the only sources of knowledge which have not undergone any changes. They are, we are reciting the Quran from the time of the Prophet until now with the same letters, with the same pronunciation and meanings the same from the time of the Prophet until the Day of Judgment. So it is the only religion who deserves to be given attention to know exactly what human beings are in need of to fulfill. Our curriculum and textbooks at the university in the psychology department and also in education and also in management and political science, they have, and sociology and so on, they have to look at this universal perspective for human needs. Now, before I end up, before I end my discussion, I would like to draw your attention to some of the characteristics of this model and this classification of needs, of human needs, mankind needs. First, it is based on revelation. Because as I said, this theory of Maqasid came as a result of induction. This induction process were carried out by Muslim scholars through history. And they have reviewed all the Quran verses and hadith and traditions, and they have come up with this generalized areas of goals which we have to achieve in our life and to be happy and to feel at peace and harmony and also to succeed in the hereafter. This also model connect revealed knowledge to acquire knowledge because we are conducting research so that it tells needs change across time and place and context. For instance, we can talk about intellectual development, but how it is conducted, how it is organized, there are many ways of fulfilling the needs that might change. So the means or the basic or the breakdown of basic needs can change from time to time. So we have the stability and change. So we are learning from knowledge generated by research and experience in the light of the generalized form of knowledge we derived and understood from Quran Sunnah. Also, it connects the temporary life here to the permanent life in the hereafter. Because since we put Iman number one, so the aim is to succeed in this life and the life to come. It connects also this model, the material needs to the spiritual needs. You can see others, they focus on material side and they forget about the basic spiritual needs of human being. It connects the individual need to societal needs. As I said, 
In Islam, we put society first. So there is an in integration between fulfilling the needs of society and fulfilling the needs of indiv individuals, families, and organizations. It connects the local to the global. As I said, this is universal because it's based on revelation. Integrate human basic needs and purposes because we have driven these needs from the Makassar. So needs and purposes are connected. Connect the heart, the mind, and the behavior. So we're talking about Iman, when we talk about Iman, we talk about the psychological, emotional, intellectual, and benefits as well. So we are talking about holistic perspective of perception or conceptualization of human beings. It integrates all human needs. So it is holistic, comprehensive, and balanced theory of human life. It is comprehensive to individual, families, organization, and societies. It is based on the true human nature because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explained in the Quran about the human nature, the good and the bad side of human nature. So that's why we say there are positive and negative sides in every area of needs because that is based on human nature or fitrah. It is suitable for every time and context. It is universal. It is realistic and doable. You can implement it in life. In fact, through history, it was implemented. It is not hierarchical, but interactive. Also, priorities could be stated based on the human life. It reflects the human accumulative knowledge, but it is more comprehensive and differ from the Western materialistic and secular theories in its foundation, so it's based on Tawheed and Iman, so it's different. Second, it's different in terms of motivation. What motivates you to fulfill this need is the pleasure of Allah, so the motivation is different. And ultimate aim, which in this life, and that we are, our aim is the hereafter and the success in the hereafter. So there are three main different uh, characteristics. Thank you very much. These are some of the characteristics of the new model, which derived from Maqasid. So it's a Maqasid theory approach into the human needs model. And uh, it is more comprehensive. It is more, um, uh, you know, feasible and it leads to happiness and success in this life and the life to come. All we have to do is to elaborate on it and teach it in universities and also apply them in our daily life, whether individual, families, organization, or society, or even among, as I said, international foundation. Jazakumullahu khairan, wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah prof. Thank you so much. Uh, while waiting for others to raise hand, we have a very good question from Brother Nuruddin. Okay. Uh, he's asking, I want to ask related to the interpretation of the Makassid Sharia, especially the point of religious human needs. What is the difference with the Western understanding of religious freedom, which tends to be to be based on the principle of relativism? and not the Tawhid paradigm. Okay. Now, as I said, the, uh, the, the, the word religion, the conceptualization of religion is different between us and the Western. The Western culture is based either on secularism or Christianity or Judaism, but mainly Christianity and secularism. They, at the moment, the most widely spread conceptualization is secularism and also individualism. They don't care about particular, you know, post-modernist approach or philosophy. They focus on the individual and relativism. In our case, as I said, in the Muslim 
impurity countries, we have to adopt this. But for them, if they are interested, they can, you know, use the freedom of religion. Unfortunately, at the moment in the West, there is no equality and freedom of religion as such because the Islamophobia in Europe and in the Western countries causing a lot of trouble to the concept of religious freedom. As we could see nowadays. So in terms of religion in our need, our needs of religion, it's clear. What do we mean by Iman? The concept of Iman is different. Tawheed is different from them. And as you could see in their uh, hierarchy of needs, they don't put place for religion at all. Yet they touch upon it from time to time, but uh, without taking it seriously. So I think we are the only religion which put emphasis on Iman, because our um, Islam is a comprehensive religion, where in this case, in their case, it is something related to individual. That's why it is relative. It's not universal. It's relative. Relative because it has nothing to do with the organization or the society. It's up to the person to go to church or not. So it's an individual, you know, belief system. In our case, as we said, we are talking about not only that, all our walks of life should be colored by our iman. So whether you are doing business or you are doing teaching or you are doing industry or whatever, it should be colored with iman, based on your iman. So there is a, a dichotomy and a very big gap between our conceptualization and their conceptualization. But when we talk to non-Muslim, the most important thing to think about is freedom of religion. So up to them to conceptualize religion in their own way, and we have to conceptualize our way to, you know, go in every aspect of our life. Wallahu a'lam. We have Brother Nasiru Bolaji Shu'aib. Go ahead, Brother. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good morning, Prof, and thanks for the beautiful presentation this morning. Say Jazakumullah wa alaikum wa Sir, I want to ask, or probably you shed light on this to a verse of the Quran that has to do with these needs. I'm going to quote a part of that verse so that we we'll see if there's any correlation in terms of the spiritual needs uh, that, that talks about the hereafter. When Allah say, I was with Allah in the Shaitan Rajim. وَبْتَغُوا فِي مَا آتَاكَ اللَّهُ دَارَ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا تَنْسَى نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Now, when we are talking about وَبْتَغِي فِي مَا آتَاكَ اللَّهُ دَارَ الْآخِرَةِ Is Allah, can we say that we are talking about the, the spiritual needs in terms of religion needs, that is, whatever you are going to do in this life that we hear you here after. And when Allah says further that Walat and Sana Siba Kamina Dunya, are we talking about the social needs here? Because that is where you are going to fend for your family, you do all the necessary things in life, with, react, interact with people and all that. So do we do what? Hello? Are you losing your voice, Brother Nasir? Hello? Anyway, okay. I, yeah. I respond with that. Maybe I, I, I couldn't understand maybe what he said exactly. But, you know, uh, we cannot say Akhira and Dunya are different. In Islam, Dunya and Akhira is one road, one way, not parallel way, it is integrated way. When you eat, this is Dunya. When you wear, it's Dunya. But there is a for it. So, Akhira and dunya are integrated together. We don't separate between the spiritual and non-spiritual. No, all spiritual. Even our work, our food, our uh, sport, exercise, all of it is spiritual as well. So this kind of 
uh, dichotomy between spiritual and non-spiritual is an accepted in Islam. That's why even the ayah which you mentioned, وَبْتَغِي بِمَعَتَ لَكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارِ الْأَخْرَةِ So both dunya and the akhira should work together. There is no separation between both. You cannot say, now I am for dunya, for dunya today. Tomorrow I will do for akhira. No, this is nothing. قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي Say my prayer. وَنُسُكِي My sacrifice. My life and death. It's all for Allah. So whether it is, uh, you know, daily activities or sacrifice or life or all for Allah. It's all Islamic. It's all spiritual, you know. Okay, brother. Uh, brother Mashhur, go ahead. May Allah be pleased with you. I always like your spirit behind your lecture. May Allah be pleased with you and continue to strengthen you, sir. My question the presentation model you designed that I shared. Uh, later on in your discussion, you said human needs is not. Uh, it doesn't have to be, it's not a matter of hierarchy that it should be interactive. In your design, you, you, you put, you know, the way you design it, religious need, life need, knowledge need, intellectual, then property. Uh, how do we uh, visualize this picture and interpret it to the interaction that you claim that it should be interactive? Do we, do we say the way you place it now? Do we say you have to be religious first? Or we can start from the property need? I mean, I need to talk more on the design. How is it interactive? I mean, visually. Brother Shahran, it's, it's interrupted. I don't know what he said. Oh, okay, about your model. Yes. Uh, yeah. Is it interactive or hierarchical? Uh, from religion, okay. uh, wealth, property, okay. the circle okay. that you are drawing? Yes. It is first interactive. Why? You can see some of the Muslims, they travel, like Mu'ad bin Jabal. Travel for months and he was hungry. The Prophet, he was putting stone in his stomach. So his food was not fulfilled. Yet, he went directly to a higher level of accepting the pleasure, I mean, seeking for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is no way to say that it is hierarchical. In Islam, it's not. It is interactive. But, however, there might be some priority. For instance, if somebody is about to die and there is only dead body of animal, he's allowed to eat in certain circumstances. So there are priorities sometimes, okay? And also, as I said, Iman is number one. That's why I put it at the bottom to show that it is the foundation of everything because you have to fight against your desire and the diseases of the heart and at the same time achieving your other daily life needs. But in general, it is not hierarchical. It is interactive. We have from uh, Ilam Sarima Lubis. Uh, Prof, I would like to ask about the model of Islamic basic human needs in life. Could you explain more about human religious need and human properties need? Is it the reflection of the Muslim life today? Yes. Now, uh, you know, I translated uh, the religious as I said, it is the Hidayah, it is the Iman and Ibadah. So people need to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be sincere. So we have to cultivate Iman in our own people everywhere. Whether as separate program or integrated even with the daily program. That's number one. With regard to property or I call it economic or wealth because people are looking for jobs. Either we have to help them to find jobs 
or to develop their own opportunities so that they can support themselves and contribute to the prosperity, economic prosperity of the country. So we are talking about the economic aspect and prosperity and de economic development of society and individual. But here, it's restricted to halal way. So again, Islam or Iman is drawing lines for us. How to generate wealth and how to develop economically and how to lead to prosperity in our society. But the next one is, is there a from Sister Mariam, is there a book where I can find the verses from the Quran where the scholars connected these human needs, elucidated, and of course, a hadith? Well, uh, first, uh, all books of Maqasid talk about higher goals. They don't talk about needs. And the one who derived the needs on the basis of Maqasid. So I would call upon you to read about Maqasid and then you see how they arrived at each Maqasid. For instance, religious goal, protection of religion. Where did they get this generalization from the Quran Sunnah? They have described it in detail. They have drawn from the different verses of Quran and from the different hadith and come up with this generalization by induction by induction okay uh we have this uh almost the same question from sister miftahun human needs from from maslow have a new need that is transcendent need that it equal with religious human needs or spiritual needs Human needs, as I said now, that, please, brother and sister, do not restrict the word spiritual to the life of individual in the mosque. No. When we talk about religious needs, we are talking about the basis of guidance, the Quran Sunnah. But when we talk about the rest of the needs, it's related to Quran and Sunnah as well. It's spiritual as well. I mean, when you eat and you make dua that it is, I hope that I'm going to uh, be energetic so that I can serve my family, serve my society. I'm looking for reward from Allah. So you are doing, fulfilling your basic needs of food. But at the same time, it is religious. You're talking about reward, talking about akhirah, talking about everything. So deen or religion goes and penetrates every aspect of our life that is the difference between our religion and other religion they, it's not restricted to only the soul alone but to everything even when we go to the toilet there is specific dua you have to be aware of your iman even in the toilet so we are talking about human needs across everything everything you need in this life and the life to come that is your needs whatever you need to achieve so that you can improve your well-being prosperity happiness in this life and the life to come these are your basic needs of course in islam there are also other type of needs uh, two types one is hajiyat and one is zaruriyat this is, we can talk about it, but what we are talking about today is the very basic night, uh, needs for life here and in the hereafter. But there are, there are other two types, we can discuss it later. Any more questions? Uh, someone want to raise hand? Then I'll open up. We have answered all from the chat room. Okay. It seems that there is no questions at all, brother. Uh, Karan. Okay. <laughs> or comments. Or oh, comments. Yeah. Uh,
Well, throughout our courses, uh, all our instructors uh, are talking about this Makassid um, Sharia. Uh, yeah, but so, I'm talking about it from a psychological, from yeah, psychology. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, why, why, what is the discourse of Makassid before, I mean, before this few years? Uh, well, I mean, okay, let me say Makassid is aims and objective of life. What are the objective of life? That's what it's called. Maqsad meaning in Arabic, objective. But higher objective. That is very broad objective. Okay, not specific objective. Because you can classify objective to a very high, medium, and lower. Maqasid, they are talking about higher level objective for life. So Quran is helping us to guide us in life, also to uh, fulfill our uh, family, uh, also wealth, also intellect, and so on. So they, they, they have that abstraction. You know, Makasa, uh, they are abstract of all the Quran Sunnah. So all Quran Sunnah uh, verses and Hadith, they are telling us what to achieve in life. That is Makasid. Now, if these are the objective in life, so it means they are reflecting our needs. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this Quran and Sunnah so that we can achieve our happiness and fulfill our needs. The lawful needs. That's my argument. We have Brother Aliyu, Rabiyu. Go ahead, Brother Aliyu. Thank you very much, Prof, for the insightful presentation. We thank you very much. May Allah strengthen you in knowledge and piety. Amen. Yes, I, I want to say that as an Ummah, we Muslims we really need the knowledge of Makasit in order to even practice the religion well. Yes. This comes to limelight, especially in this uh, uh, coronavirus period. Yes. There are a lot of things that Muslims seem to be so rigid about when it comes to the, the, the preventive measures put in place by, uh, by the expert health professionals. For example, when it comes to the issue of uh, social distancing in the mosque, yes. uh, when it comes to the yes, putting of the self, you see some Muslims are rejecting, uh, especially because from my own point of view, they lack the basic knowledge of Makasit. Uh, because what Allah is after is for us to serve him. And when there are times that we need to adjust and that is the flexibility that the Sharia of Islam has against many other laws. So I think even in our own curriculum, in our curricula in schools, in the universities, we need yes. to really uh, develop these concepts for our Muslim brothers and sisters to be updated and of course to be fully uh, into the Sharia as a whole. So uh, this is a point that also here in Nigeria we are calling for the for the integration, especially of this Makasit and all other uh, our activities. So I thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity, and inshallah we hope that this course is uh, is going to be an eye opener for many of us to to continue to be uh, good Muslims as we can. Jazakumullah khaira. Yeah. Uh, thank you, brother. I'm um, very proud of you and the way you are, uh, uh, you know, advocating this. As you yes. said, our pro problem is that we are very rigid and dogmatic about our knowledge, which is irrelevant sometimes to life. So if we understand Maqasid, then we can relate text to context. We have to relate text to context so that we can revive Islam as a practical religion rather than a knowledge-based religion which is taught in universities for the sake of knowledge we want to learn 
Islam for the sake of implementation in our life. And maqasid help us a lot to make ruling and decision regarding all different walks of life. I hope that our brothers and sisters in universities can also perpetuate and create awareness among students and give them assignment to relate text to context on the basis of maqasid. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, I remember one of our friends uh, in the U.S. Yes. That his uh, teenage son was complaining that lamb for him not relevant in the U.S. <laughs> because whatever the father said is not the same as what the friend wants. So relating text to context is very urgent and important. So to make our religion is relevant in this today world. And then Makassi is the answer for it, inshallah. Any final word, Prof, before we close? Uh, well, all I have to say, may Allah bless you all, Triple IT, Brother Sharan and others, and also all the brothers and sisters who attended from different corners of the world, may Allah bless them all and help us to be better Muslim. Jazakumullahu khairan wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.